From 632 to 800, Byzantium found itself in what can only really be described as a dark age. During this period, Byzantium produced very few major texts, and without these literary sources to guide us, we really don't have a very clear picture of a lot of important historical events like the emergence of the thematic system, the Slavic invasions, the Arab invasions. We find ourselves having to piece together things from archaeology and then engage in guesswork and rely upon much later sources to get a picture of what happened. So in this video I'd like to talk about how the Byzantine Dark Ages came to pass and what ultimately led to the end of this Dark Age. In the ancient and medieval worlds, it was customary for many scholars and larger institutions of learning to be subsidized or outright completely funded by the state, um, something which is still largely true in the modern world. By the 7th century, the general atrophy of the empire meant that money was tight against the board. Many revenue-producing provinces had been lost, and the empire could no longer afford to pay for things the way that it had in the past. This um, devastation also extended to elite patrons who sometimes would pay um, other people to become scholars and write works. The ultimate example of state patronage in an institution of learning, of course, is the Library at Alexandria, which was the pride and joy of Ptolemaic Egypt and something that was maintained by the Romans at a later date. Um, now, the library at Alexandria had been decaying and declining for years and at some point during this period it was burnt down and I think that's sort of a great metaphor for everything that's going on in the Byzantine Dark Ages. Um, now this level of devastation um, both physically in cities and in terms of just there being no funding available to keep the doors of libraries and institutions of learning open meant that after the 7th century, the only surviving institutional learning was the University of Constantinople, which had been founded back in 425. Um, however, there's considerable reason to believe that this university had also scaled back its activities and production considerably um, during this period. One of the most fundamental facts about Rome and Byzantium is that these empires are fundamentally urban empires. These empires are governed from cities, and all of the things that we think of as being hallmarks of the civilization, baths, um, public buildings, public works, town forums, hippodromes, theaters, all of these things are located in cities. So everything that defines Roman Byzantium occur, um, exist in cities, and they administer justice from these cities. Um, they gather resources at these cities. So, to a large extent, uh, you know, an old Roman map can show this more eloquently than I can. Um, the Romans and Byzantines really thought of their empires being a series of cities that are strung together, and the rural areas are just kind of there. Um, they're there to supp uh, give supplies, but ultimately life, or at least um, the life of a civilization, occurred in a city. Now, the reason why cities are important throughout time for really producing culture is that it's only an urban economy which has enough variety to create leisure. Um, so you have pr uh, productive classes and then classes who can live off of the revenue produced by others. And once you have leisure, then you can engage in um, creative activities which create what we call high culture. Um, other things which really foster literacy in a city are trade. Um, you need to keep records to you know keep track of your revenue and the goods you're trading, negotiate deals with other cities and merchants. Administration, as I said, governance comes from these cities, so you have to keep governmental records of taxes and um, deal with diplomacy. Um, you know, deal with internal affairs, uh, you know, garbage removal, whatever might be going on. Um, there's politics in cities. People compete for seats on city councils. Um, and also, cities need forms of entertainment to let off the pressure because a lot of cities in the ancient world and medieval world tend to be nasty and overcrowded. So, one way to kind of keep people happy is to provide some form of entertainment. 
And um, one form of entertainment would be drama, which requires writing. So in all possible ways, cities really help to foster and encourage literacy. Um, they also foster civic pride, which further inspires literacy by making people want to build monuments telling the history of their city and to write local histories about things that have happened there in the past. In addition, these great cities are competitive with one another and lots of these great cities sponsored their own schools of rhetoric and philosophy. Um, famously, Athens had about three or four schools of philosophy. Antioch had a great school of rhetoric. Um, we saw in an earlier video that Antioch and Alexandria were great rivals in terms of theology, so each one had its own complete school of the theology and way of reading the Bible. Um, so these inner city rivalries are really important for promoting intellectual life as the Romans knew it. So over the past couple of videos we've really been talking a lot about how the Byzantine Empire was really ravaged by war during the early 7th century. The Byzantine Sasanian War of 602 to 628 followed by the Slavic invasion of the Balkans and the Arab invasions. Between those three events most of Byzantium cities were either reduced to a shadow of their former selves or they were outright destroyed or conquered. Um, and you can imagine the impact that would have on literacy right off the bat. Um, now by the end of the 7th century we see that the only surviving cities that I can really name are Constantinople, Thessalonica, Athens which was never a big city especially not in this period it was basically a college town Syracuse I'm not really sure how big it was this period probably not all that big and maybe Corinth which again was not all that big and was mostly just a port only these cities are ones that I can really point to as being for sure intact and under imperial control now the cities that did survive which had maybe been sacked or whatever or sometimes conquered these cities are also greatly reduced in wealth and population and these reductions in wealth and population mean that the economy is now less specialized so you have fewer people who have leisure and you also have less excess material wealth that can then go into building and maintaining centers of learning so this will clearly have a very negative effect on the ability of these regions to produce high culture so in most general treatments of the Middle Ages, you'll hear that Constantinople was this great metropolis of the Middle Ages and that it had this booming urban life and that it was seen as a beacon of civilization to all of its neighbors. What a lot of these sources don't tell you though is that Constantinople was only a shadow of its former self. Um, during the 7th century, when the Persians had overrun Egypt, Heraclius actually ended the Annona, the ancient grain dole. And that was because Egypt was gone, and without it, they couldn't uh, find the grain to distribute to the population. So the Annona was this idea dating back to ancient Rome and then continuing Constantinople that um, you could provide free grain to the population because they couldn't produce enough money living in this competitive city to keep themselves fed. Well, after Heraclius cuts this grain dole, the population of Constantinople falls to about a fifth or maybe even a tenth of what it had been before. So it goes from about half a million people to 50 to 100,000. And most of these people fled to Thrace looking for work on farms. And um, we've already talked about the Slavic invasions of that area and the Avar invasions. So probably a very large percentage of the people who went out there looking for farm work were either killed or they starved. So it was pretty much a humanitarian disaster. In many ways, Constantinople in the 7th century was what Detroit was in, well, today. Um, anyway, uh, the Byzantines made an effort uh, to counterbalance this by attacking Kherson, which is in the modern-day Crimea, and they were able to grow some grain or trade for grain there but it really just didn't produce anywhere near the amount of grain that they needed so it actually was not a very successful offset. Now the one thing that Constantinople still did have however was the Imperial Library with a hundred thousand volumes. However during the seventh century when funding was at a premium there wasn't really a lot of activity. We can look at manuscript traditions and see that not a lot happened during this time. 
Um, there wasn't a lot of work done in copying existing manuscripts, and we know that new works simply were mostly not being composed. So if the Byzantine Dark Ages are one of the perigees of Byzantine civilization, then what happened which enabled Byzantium to make a comeback? Um, many of you already know that Byzantium lasts all the way until 1453. So what is it which enabled them to make a comeback? Basically, the answer is that there was a combination of the thematic system which enabled them to better organize themselves and then they began to have more resources once the medieval warm period begins around the year 900. And the existence of the thematic system when this warm period kicked in is largely why the Byzantines were the first power to really begin to experience a, a time of resurgence around the year 900. Um, and this resurgence was most strongly felt where the Byzantines were weakest in the Balkans. Um, the Byzantines will actually reach their next peak, the biggest uh, and strongest they had been in centuries, under the reign of Basil II from 976 to 1025. And not only does he succeed in conquering lots of territory, but he also presides over a booming export economy, which included silk, and um, victories on all fronts, even the ones where he wasn't personally present. However, um, eventually, other powers will be able to benefit from the general growth and urban renewal of the medieval warm period, and that will, of course, offset the advantages that Byzantium will enjoy during the 10th century.